started. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. <laughs> so, so today um, we're going to have the um, usual public health and medicine seminar series. Um, the public health and medicine seminar series is designed to increase awareness of the intersection of public health and medicine. It's supported by the Drexel University College of Medicine, uh, Department of Emergency Medicine, the Drexel University School of Public Health, um, Health Management and Policy Department, the Center for Nonviolence and Social Justice, and the Pennsylvania Public Health Training Center. And so all of this in, is to get everybody on the same page around public health and medicine. Today we have the distinct pleasure to hear from an amazing multi-talented physician that you all know, um, or some of you may know, um, Dr. Ralph Riviello, um, who's a friend and a colleague. Um, he's a also a public health leader. Dr. Riviello is an associate professor of emergency medicine. He's a graduate of Hahnemann University School of Medicine and completed his residency in emergency medicine at Allegheny General Hospital. He holds a master's degree in forensic medicine and is current chair of the ASEP forensic medicine section. Dr. Riviello actively participated in developing Philadelphia's new model for sexual assault medical care in Philadelphia. He currently serves as the medical director of the Philadelphia Sexual Assault Response Center. Among other things, Dr. Riviello is the president of the board of Pennsylvania ASAP. More recently, he testified before the House Insurance Committee on behalf of emergency physicians, the need for malpractice reform. Plainly put, Dr. Riviello is an awesome physician leader and lots has been and will be learned from him. Please welcome Dr. Riviello. Thanks, Ted. I couldn't have written that better myself. So uh, good afternoon. Thanks for coming out and spending some time here with us today. So I think the process that we're going to talk about today is a great example of how public health and medicine can intersect and really work together to make a systems change. And we're going to talk about a process that we went through here uh, in Philadelphia starting back in 2008 that came to uh, fruition last year, and we'll give you some of those details. So before I get started, I just need to say that I have no financial disclosures or any conflicts of interest in giving this talk. And that here are some of the objectives that we've outlined. One is to define what a sexual assault response team is, understand what the medical response to sexual assault is, review the history of how we did it here in Philadelphia in the past, how we redefined it, why we redefined it, and how it exists today, and some of the future goals of uh, what we do here in Philadelphia. So let's start simply with just some terminology so everybody gets back up on speed and understands where we're coming from. So I used the term once already in the talk, sexual assault response team, or a SART, S-A-R-T, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you don't know what it is. So it's a multidisciplinary intra-agency team of individuals working collaboratively to provide services for the community by offering specialized sexual assault intervention services. So I think that's a great definition and I think it really extends into the public health model of how we did this process and how we do things here in Philadelphia. Uh, it varies from community to community. Clearly a big community like Philadelphia, we have a pretty large uh, SART uh, we meet regularly and that kind of stuff. Other communities, it may be much smaller and much may have different composition. Usual representatives at this committee include representatives from law enforcement, the rape crisis centers, healthcare, uh, criminal justice system, and other social service agencies, victim services agencies, and colleges and universities. So we're going to talk more about the Philadelphia Sexual Assault Response Team and how we uh, did what we did. Uh, but let's go over a little bit about why we do a forensic rape exam and what a forensic medical exam is. So basically, there's a few functions of it. And the top three or four are listed here. And it's to evaluate and treat bodily injury, evaluate and document genital injury, collect any forensic evidence that may exist, provide sexually transmitted infection prophylaxis, to provide emergency contraception to prevent pregnancies, to provide HIV prophylaxis, to provide linkage to services, whether that includes the rape crisis centers, police, or other social service agencies. And then a big goal of it is to eventually present testimony at trial as 
an expert witness in the case. So this is what we do for any victim who presents requesting a rape evaluation, a rape kit to be collected. And <clears throat> if you keep these in mind, you'll see why we did what we did here in, this, in the city. Another term you're going to hear me use a little bit later in the talk is a sexual assault nurse examiner or a SANE nurse. These are registered nurses who have specialized training in caring for sexually assaulted or sexually abused patients. And really, their development came out of a need. And in the past, back you know, in the 1970s, essentially, even 60s, um, ED staffs really regarded the needs of sexual assault victims as less urgent than other patients in the emergency department. And that victims often endured very long wait times in very busy, public, crowded places of the emergency department. Uh, victims weren't allowed to eat, drink, or urinate while waiting because those are important elements that we do in the rape collection of evidence, in the rape kit collection of evidence. So these victims would sometimes be sitting in waiting rooms for four or five hours and to a note, you can't eat, you can't drink, you can't pee, you just got to sit there and wait. Um, a lot of the physicians and RNs at the time weren't even trained in how to do these exams or how to collect evidence or what important evidence needed to be collected. Uh, physicians were afraid to go to court to have to testify, so they were very reluctant to do the examinations. And the ED staff themselves didn't recognize uh, sexual assault uh, victimization and often overlooked the need to treat them with sensitivity and respect and basically, like I said, they were allowed to wait. Oftentimes, you know, you'd hear stories of they'd start an exam and something more urgent came up, so they left, left the victim just sitting there, would go back in in an hour to do another part of the exam and go back. So clearly not a very victim-friendly system. So back in the mid to late 70s, uh, a group of nurses uh, formed uh, the International Association of Forensic Nurses and developed what now is known as a sexual assault nurse examiner. And these were first formed in Minneapolis, Memphis, and Amarillo, Texas. Uh, so, so some places where you would be a little bit surprised that they would create this first and not in any big metropolitan area. But it rapidly uh, took off from those three locations. It's a 40-hour course after you have your RN degree and that kind of stuff. It's a 40-hour course. It includes a lot of practical experience and shadowing of other nurses. There's a certification test that's available that uh, nurses can take. And several studies have shown that there are benefits when you use sexual assault nurse examiners. You have improved evidence collection. You have more complete documentation of injury and what happened. The victim gets better overall care. And uh, the nurses actually provide very consistent and solid testimony in court. So Philadelphia has been fortunate to have a very strong sexual assault nurse examiner uh, program for years in the city, and that's who we rely on today to do our examinations. <clears throat> so let's combine the two. Let's combine the SART team, and let's combine the SANE nurses or the medical response and define some medical SART models. So there's basically two ways you could have a medical SART or do a medical SART. The first one is hospital-based. And in these models, it's usually based in the emergency department for logical reasons. One, the ED is open 24-7. It's usually a secure area, so victim safety, you know, is insured. Uh, there's a wide array of medical and support services available, the lab, x-ray, um, trauma surgeons if you need them, other specialty services. Physicians are there to treat any other injuries that may be, you know, sustained during the crime or need to be evaluated. Some hospitals use on-duty sexual assault nurse examiners. So these are nurses who are working a regular shift in the ED, probably have a lighter assignment, maybe they're a float nurse, and then when there's a rape victim, they get pulled out of their assignment to do the case. Or they could use an on-call system where when the victim presents, they call the on-call nurse, she comes in and performs the examination. The problem with hospital-based systems is that the ED overhead costs and the physician fees can really be sizable and it can actually limit the effectiveness of a program. And in some of these hospital models, they've looked at using some alternative sites like clinic space or urgent care space as a way to kind of cut down those costs or only to involve the physician when there's other injuries or other complaints. The other model is more of a community-based model, which often offers more privacy than a hospital exam site 
There's better billing procedures, so you can actually recoup the costs that you put into the program. And there's a lot better uh, coordination of service providers and coordination among the other SART members. You need to work with the hospitals, though, to develop protocols if somebody is injured or needs more advanced attention than you could provide in a community center. Uh, medication acquisition can sometimes be difficult, depending on who's running the center and how you get the medications you need. And we could talk a little bit more about that later on. And oftentimes, these could be either housed or sponsored by the hospitals, the rape crisis centers, prosecutors, or even be formed as a private-based company. So I know in California, there's several sexual assault nurse examiner programs that are an entrepreneurial in Denver, endeavor by nurses that they form this corporation and they provide the services uh, to their municipalities and that. And as a community-based model, you also have the capabilities of forming a mobile team, which can actually go to hospitals and other sites to collect evidence and do the forensic rape exams. So let's talk a little bit about Philadelphia and what, what went on here. So Philadelphia has a SART. In fact, I just came from the SART meeting today. We meet every other month. And we call it the Philadelphia Sexual Assault Advisory Committee, or PSAC. Uh, it's multi-agency representation. We meet usually monthly to bi-monthly, depending on any needs or urgencies going on in the city. We work very closely with the Special Victims Unit and the District Attorney's Office. And some of the projects that we've over undertaken over the past few years included developing medical protocols for treatment of victims in the city so that it was consistent across all hospitals and every hospital knew what to do. Uh, we've developed the police directive on how to transport patients to the hospitals, where to go with them, and what to do. And they were very instrumental in developing our new center, which we're going to get to next. And these are just some of the representative members uh, from that of that organization. And you can see it's, it's pretty wide-based and Several of these have multiple forms of representation. So um, Temple University Police Department is a representative of the committee, but also uh, their Women's Center, because they provide some counseling services to rape victims on campus. Uh, we work closely with the Children's Alliance, who does forensic uh, interviews of children. Uh, clearly, you know, there's a police presence, there's a DA's presence, public health department. So there's a lot of representatives uh, from the city on, these com on this committee. So here's some local statistics. Uh, in 2011, there were 833 cases in Philadelphia. Now, this is preliminary because some of this data is still being um, calculated. And in 2010, there were 945 cases reported to the police in Philadelphia. And that's out of 3,400 cases in the entire state of Pennsylvania. The problem with these numbers is that they're underestimates and they're under reports because in order for these numbers to count you have to have the definition of a rape which up until last year was defined as carnal knowledge of a female forcibly and against her will and nobody really knows what that means and as you know children are victims of rape men are victims of rape and um, carnal knowledge only includes vaginal penetration so oral penetration, anal penetration, all other forms of sexual assault are excluded from this definition. Fortunately, uh, last year, the FBI, through some federal mandates and some uh, regulation changes, actually changed the definition that gets reported to the Uniform Crime Codes. And you're going to see increased numbers of rapes for different municipalities, not because there's more rapes happening. It's just we're able to better capture them by the definition. So what was the Philadelphia experience? So I'm not sure if anybody in the room is old enough to remember the Philadelphia General Hospital, but Philadelphia used to have a general hospital located in West Philadelphia. It's now over by where the VA, it used to be over where the VA is, over by Penn. And <clears throat> all forensic rape services were provided at Philadelphia General Hospital. It was a traditional county hospital, and victims were brought there from all parts of the city to get their rape exam. And interestingly, it was one of the first hospitals, if not the first hospital in the country, that actually had rape crisis counselors 
in the emergency department ready to respond to victims when they, when they present it there. And they used to have what was called the war, because war is our rape crisis center in Philadelphia, women organized against rape. They used to have a war room right there in the emergency department where the rape crisis counselor would sit, take call, and just be there to respond to any victim's needs. And at the time, it was in very close proximity to where the war offices were so that they could even walk a victim over to their office to you know, begin counseling and, and other services. Unfortunately, uh, uh, Philadelphia General Hospital closed in 1977. So after it closed, we needed to come up with a new way to do things. So a group of people got together, mostly that are still members of the uh, Sexual Assault Advisory Committee, and they decided to designate two hospitals as rape crisis ERs in the city. And it was a geographic delineation. Basically, Market Street runs right through the city, and they picked a hospital on one side of Market Street, and they picked a hospital on the other side of Market Street. And depending on where your crime went, occurred based on Market Street is what hospital you were brought to for your services. Um, all new protocols were written for the two facilities. The police directive was changed that when a police officer responded and there was a rape victim, they knew which hospital to take the patient to, who to call, and what needed to happen. And the city stepped up and started providing funds for the uh, centers via the city public health department, uh, via the division of maternal and child health. So this was the model that worked in the city for several, several years until about, let's say, 2005, 2006, when we started to notice there were some issues. So let's go over some of these issues and you'll see why they became important. So the first two issues are kind of the same issue. So this is what a rape victim would experience in the city if she was raped. So here is where the rape occurred at the crime scene. She would go ahead and let's call 911. 911 would respond, take her to the hospital where she'd have a forensic rape kit performed and evidence collection and all that kind of stuff. Then she would be taken to the special victims unit to talk to the police there, to the detectives. And then afterwards, she'd be taken back home uh, after everything was done and all the interviews were taken. So as you could see, you know, victim went from crime scene to hospital to police department to back home. And sometimes this process could take several hours, sometimes even up to half a day to uh, eight, ten hours. Now let's just say the patient did a different step. Let's say they had the crime occur here. They presented to the hospital, but it wasn't one of the two designated rape crisis hospitals. So then the police had to be called and a transfer had to be arranged for her to go to one of the rape crisis hospitals to get her rape kit. Then after the rape kit was collected, she was taken to the special victims unit to get her interview. And then finally, after all that was done, she could go home. So clearly not a very victim-centered approach that we're driving people all over the city. So imagine your crime occurred all the way up in Northeast Philly. You had to be taken down you know, closer to Center City where the rape crisis ER was, then back over to the other side of North Philly to see the Special Victims Unit, back and forth, back and forth. So we felt it wasn't a very friendly um, system that placed the victim first. Then the city stopped funding the rape crisis hospitals. Now, I would tell you that the money they used to fund us wasn't a great deal. Um, it was about 20 grand a year and you really didn't do a lot with it. But, you know, we made it work. You know, we paid for supplies, we paid for training, et cetera, et cetera. But once the city stopped that money, there was less money for new SANE training and existing SANE training, and we had less money to run the programs and do programmatic support. So that became an issue. And then the other thing that really probably was the straw that broke the camel's back here was that at least two hospitals, probably even a couple more, that were in very close proximity to those two rape crisis emergency departments, their hospitals closed completely, including closing the emergency departments. So that just dumped increased volumes onto both of those emergency departments. And that led to ED crowding, increased wait times for victims, and rape victims were waiting hours sometimes for these exams again, going back to what we had in the 1970s that we had worked so hard to fix. So. We found that victims were leaving without any evidence collection, without ever talking to the police, sometimes leaving without any medical treatment, 
uh, became very they became very distrustful of the entire process and uncooperative with any law enforcement investigations and that. And a lot of the victims were being seen as evasive or non-disclosing or even non-credible at times. So we were like, this is a problem. This has to stop. So we had an idea that our services in the city of Philadelphia should be very victim-centered, meaning instead of bringing the victim to services, let's try to bring services to the victim. So we formed a subgroup of the Philadelphia Sexual Assault Advisory Committee, and it was a small group. We had one representative from the police department, a representative from the DA's office, one or two representatives from the Rape Crisis Center, and four representatives from the Rape Crisis Hospitals. And we met several times over a six month period to decide what we were gonna do and how we were gonna fix the problem. One of the things we did was we reviewed other models of care across the country. So we went and saw, well, we didn't go anywhere, but we went online and saw what other services were provided in other cities, talked to people from those cities and heard how their models work and didn't work and what the pros and cons were. And then we tried to look at our own patient population and realized that even though all these victims were going to the emergency room, they really had very few emergency needs. Very few of them were injured that needed x-rays or a trauma surgeon evaluation or closed head injury or needed um, stitches. A lot of them just needed the basic forensic medical exam that I talked about earlier. So after putting everything all together, we decided, well, gee, why don't we open a freestanding site that's available 24 seven that maybe will be co-located with the special victims unit to make things even easier for victims. So we put together our whole proposal and our plan. We presented it to the mayor's office who loved the idea. And in fact, in the meeting said, well, we envisioned this happening already for some other services and co-locating services. This will be great. We'll put this in part as part of it and we'll have a whole big center to, you know, for victims to go to. Unfortunately, right about the same time as when the economy crumped and the city's budgets were a mess and became bankrupt and those kind of things. Well, not bankrupt, but there was a lot of financial issues. So the city put this plan on hold to co-locate all these services. So therefore that put our center plans on hold thinking that, well, it's on the back burner, but they're gonna be working towards doing this and opening it and that. So we waited and then we waited and we realized that it wasn't getting any better. Victims were still having bad experiences and wait times and all that kind of stuff. So as a committee, we decided let's move forward to try to develop this on our own and see what we could do and see what we could accomplish. So the first question that came up is how are we gonna fund this or who's gonna sponsor it? Where's this gonna be housed under all these different uh, organizations? So we went to the two current hospitals that did the services and they were like, oh, great idea, but we can't help you. We're not interested in doing this. This is a big project. Nope, sorry, thank you. We went to a few other hospitals in the city um, to ask them if they'd be willing to house us or you know, let us use space, et cetera, et cetera. And we got the same usual, no, we don't have any space. No, we're not interested. Or, oh sure, we'd be happy to have you, but you can't give emergency contraception because we're a Catholic hospital. So we were like, all right, those, those places aren't gonna work. We went to war, the Rape Crisis Center, and said, can you house us? And they were like, oh no, that would be a conflict of interest because we're more victims' rights, victim services, and because it's evidence collection, you need to be pretty impartial. So no, we, don't, we can't house you. We'll do anything we want to help you or can to help you. We'll be very active participants in the process, but we can't house you as part of us. We went to the district attorney's office. They said, no, that's even a bigger conflict of interest because then it gets into who are you working for? Are you working for the DA? Are you working for the police, et cetera, et cetera? So they said no. The police said no and actually felt that, that had, they had the biggest conflict of interest of everybody else in the process. So they were out. The public health department for some reason said great idea, but nope, sorry, we're not interested. We even went to another outside agency and they had interest and we were, you know, we thought it would potentially work out, but there were some limitations in the plan and the process and we stopped going that way. So one of the other things we thought of was maybe we should form our own nonprofit, which is some of the children advocacy center models out there where we would form our own nonprofit and run it independently that way. Well, 
we got a pro bono attorney who was willing to help us and those kind of things. And we found out, well, gee, it's really easy to incorporate ourselves as a nonprofit and inexpensive, et cetera, et cetera. So we created our budgets and we were ready to go forward with it. And then we realized that our budget didn't include malpractice costs for everybody, insurance, just to have insurance on the building and, and the sidewalks and all that other stuff. And we needed an accounting department or a way to you know, bill for services to pay the nurses. We needed a payroll process. And they clearly the very simple, you know, budget that looked right and made sense and didn't lose money became a much huger budget that had a lot more expenses uh, than income. So that fell by the wayside. So <clears throat> interestingly, around the same time, I was having a discussion about it with uh, Rich Hamilton, our chair, who actually said to me, well, why don't you just put together a plan and we could present it to the dean and let's see if they would be interested in housing it here at Drexel. So took out all the files, retweaked everything, put together a new budget and a whole new proposal. And in the summer of 2010, met with Dean Homan at the time and he loved the idea and actually said, it's a great community service to do for Philadelphia and it really fits with the women's health issue, uh, women's health mission of DUCOM. So he gave us the green light to go ahead. At the same time, while all this was happening, we had actually identified a site to put the center. And that site was located in a medical office building right on the same campus as the Special Victims Unit. And in fact, they're only separated by a parking lot. And they're actually connected to each other by an underground tunnel if the weather's bad or anything like that. So we're like, all right, we have a site. Uh, and then the subcommittee actually chose a name for the center. So the name was chosen as Philadelphia Sexual Assault Response Center. So we had a site, we had a name, and this was the layout of the office that we were gonna rent uh, from the, the center. And basically, small waiting area, some administrative type space, two examination rooms, uh, storage space, and another office. So it's about a thousand square feet total. They put a sign on the door for us. And basically, here's just some pictures of what the center looks like. So there's, as you walk in, there's kind of the, um, the registration area, and that takes you into the back offices. There's a view of it from the waiting room. There's our small waiting room. That's one of, that's one of the exam rooms, and that's the main room we use for all of our examinations. The hallway between the two exam rooms. Here's the one office space that we have. Here's the supply room uh, with all the supplies. It's a pretty big space, so we were pleased we had that. And then here's the other room that we hoped to use as a second exam site, but really it's become a store, an additional storage space and a mini lab and some other features. And then here's the uh, desk area where we do a lot, the nurses do a lot of their charting and everything else. So, and I can tell you that that space was those photographs happened after we opened. So. Um, so when we decided to form this, we had a lot of input from all the agencies involved. And when I say a lot of input, there was a lot of input. Um, like I said, we developed our budget and we based our budget on about 500 cases per year based on what the totals look like from the city and the experiences at the previous two hospitals and that kind of stuff. We decided we needed a program director to run things day to day. Um, and that person we tapped for that was a retired special victims unit lieutenant who had just retired and was looking for something else to do. So he said, yeah, I'd love to do it. So we hired him on board and he's been a great addition and I'll tell you some of the stuff why. And then we developed all of the medical protocols and all of the flow protocols and all that kind of stuff. We had input from other programs in the state, some other national programs on how they did things. Uh, everybody had a chance to review every document and every policy and every procedure and all that kind of stuff. And we had tons of reviews and revisions and re-reviews and everything else until we got something we thought would work well. So we worked out all of our patient flow issues. Um, one of the things that had to be rewritten was the police directive because the police directive actually said that if a police officer responds, they're to take the victim to one of the rape crisis hospitals, not to our center. So there's several thousand Philadelphia police officers that now need to know how to do this differently. And the police department works by what are called directives. And every police officer knows all of the directives. And 
until they're changed, they're not to deviate from their policy. So one of the things we had to do was develop the whole police directive. And in that directive, we had to decide to tell the police officers how they make the decision if they should take the patient to an emergency room or to our center directly. So we wrote very simple protocols for them that basically said, if you think they're too drunk or too high or too injured or they're visibly bleeding or they're complaining of injuries, you take them to the emergency room and then let them sort it out and then refer the patient to us. Otherwise, you could just bring the patient to us and we'll start the entire process. Um, we actually talked about what about the victim who doesn't want to report to the police because they have that right not to report to the police, but they also have the right to get the forensic exam. And the police really stepped up here and said, we'll be happy to help with those patients. We'll provide security and safety for them. We'll help initiate the whole process and we'll still be the contact person from them and not take any report or have to worry about it. And we decided that when we went ahead and called in our SANE nurses, that it would all be done via an answering service so that we have a direct line. The police call the nurse, the nurse call, but Cleet calls the answering service, the answering service calls the nurse, and the whole process starts. Uh, we went ahead and had to buy supplies and equipment because this was just an empty space that we had when we took it over. So one of the nice things about doing this under Drexel was that Drexel has preferred vendors and different things where you could get substantial savings by going under these preferred vendors. So that's where we got most of our supplies and anything else that we needed that didn't fit that. Um, I could tell you we scoured websites looking for the best price on something versus another website's price and that kind of stuff. Um, we hired our SANE nurses and I'll, I'll be proud to say that I stole them from other hospitals that had used SANE nurses. They were mostly nurses I had worked with at another hospital in the city. Uh, a lot of them then came by word of mouth and they had a friend who had a friend and et cetera, et cetera. And we hired them, we trained them, we got them all on board. And then finally on May 11th, uh, 2011, we opened our doors for our first patient. Now this process actually began probably back in May, June of 2008. So the process took almost three years to really get up and running, much, uh, much longer than we all anticipated. So what do we have currently? So currently we have 24-7 availability of our sexual assault nurse examiners, or if I'm on call, it's a forensic examiner because I'm not a nurse. But um, <clears throat> available, they, they take call, they take 12-hour shifts, they're on call, they're ready to come in. I currently have 18 nurses who staff the center, and they have experience ranging from anywhere from three years to a couple of nurses who have more than 20 years of experience as a sexual assault nurse examiner. We treat patients age 16 and over, and that just became out of a cooperative agreement with the children's hospitals that they were happy to see under 16 and they would like us to see over 16. So we see 16 and over, but I will tell you that at three o'clock in the morning, sometimes math gets a little bit fuzzy and a 15 year old or maybe even a 14 year old um, has crept into our office um, and we were happy to serve them. We're available regardless of the victim's willingness to participate with law enforcement or to file a police report. We provide all the services I mentioned. We do the rape exam, we collect a rape kit, we provide pregnancy prophylaxis, STD prophylaxis, HIV prophylaxis, we do it all right there and we testify. Uh, and we fortunately have had very good reviews from both our district attorney's office, the police department especially. Our forensic lab has been very pleased because we've really done quality evidence collection, quality kits, all the documentation is there that they need. And most importantly, we've gotten very nice reviews from patients when we've contacted them in follow-up. They've said that they've really appreciated the services that we were providing. And one of the neat features of our service is that it's in a private setting. You're not in an emergency department. And when you present there, you as the victim are one-on-one -on -one with that nurse. There are no interruptions because there's a trauma coming in. There's no interruptions because the nurse's other patient needs a bedpan. Um, they're in that room and everything is focused on that one victim. That waiting room that I showed you, I don't think has ever been used by a patient because when they arrive, the nurse is there waiting for them and they're taken right into the treatment area. We use the waiting room for the police. So the police officers have a place to sit and watch TV or if any family members come. So we've really gotten the whole process streamlined. 
I can tell you that since we opened until last week, we saw 700 cases at the center. And so far for fiscal year 2012, we did 472 cases. 21 of them were males, about 4.4%. We had 58.6% African Americans and 32.6% uh, Caucasians. And conveniently, a lot of the victims are coming from areas that are close by to where we are, mostly North Philly, Northeast Philly, and Center City. And we've been able to streamline the process that most of our exams take about an hour and a half. In the past, some of these exams have taken four to six hours, and I think a lot of that was just because of the inefficiencies of being in an emergency department, uh, because you had to go run to get the supply, run to get a medication. Everything that the nurse needs is conveniently located in that one room, and they could stay in that room with the victim from start to finish and do everything that needs to happen. Um, so we were pretty pleased with this. This is just an example of some of my SANE nurses um, and the number of cases they did just in 2011, so just in those six months that we were open. As you can see, we had two nurses who took a lot of call and or had just bad luck of being on call when most of the rapes occurred in the city and did almost, one, almost, one did almost 60 cases in six months, uh, the other one did 55. Um, some of the ones who have only did one or two were actually newer hires towards the end of 2011, so they didn't have an opportunity to take a lot of call. So one of the things we were concerned about was patient safety, both, you know, are they safe from the attacker, from other influences or violence and that kind of stuff? And then we want to know, are our patients medically safe by not going to the emergency department? So I will tell you, we've had zero rapid response team calls. So our campus is actually a hospital. It's another uh, health system in the city. And we rent the space from them to provide the service. And I will tell you that there's a full freestanding emergency department located right down the floor below us. And we have an agreement that if we have an emergency or something needs to happen, we could call a rapid response team and the emergency department will respond and take the patient and take them back to the emergency department for stabilization and all that. Fortunately, we've had zero need to call them for that. So we were happy about that. We had one STAT 13 call which is the hospital's code for like violent patient or bad situation and a lot of security guards and you need some muscle to come. And the hospital is actually a psychiatric facility as well, so they have a lot of these for their psych patients. We actually had one of these calls in the whole year and a half that we've been open. And it was a, a boyfriend trying to get into the center to see his girlfriend who was having an exam and she did not want him in there and he threatened to throw our Quest lab specimen box through the glass window uh, and all that. While a police officer stood on the other side of the door with her gun drawn saying, no, you're not coming in here. So uh, fortunately, the situation was diffused very easily by the police officer with the gun and the security guards uh, from the hospital. But that was the only really violent episode we had at the center. And in this 700 patients that we've treated, only six had to be sent to the emergency department. So only 1.2% of our victims had a need to go to the emergency department, which means I think that the police triage of patients is actually pretty good, as well as the patient self-triage. Um, the patients that had to be transferred, one had an internal vaginal injury and needed to go to have that laceration repaired. Another woman was actually pregnant and was having abdominal pain and had to go get a pregnancy evaluation. Uh, two people had some pain and injury complaints that needed further investigation. One victim was intoxicated and couldn't complete the exam and was nauseated and vomiting and had to go down to the ED for fluids. And the other patient was interesting. It was a woman who was having a hypertensive or high blood pressure crisis. And she had been transferred to us from another emergency department where she presented um, saying I was raped. And they transferred her to us where she had been hypertensive in the emergency department the whole time there, and when she got to us, her pressure was still sky high. So we collected the kit and then sent her to the emergency department to get her blood pressure addressed. So, so I think we've proven, at least to ourselves and any of our naysayers out there when we were talking about the project, that this really is safe. We've had no safety issues around victims. Um, we've had no issues around medical complications or problems that people were mistriaged or miscategorized and sent to us instead. 
<clears throat> so when I was asked to talk about this, one of the things Ted talked about was, well, what are some of the lessons learned? And we've gotten phone calls after people have heard about us doing this. They say, well, what are your lessons learned? What do, you, what do you think about this whole process? Well, the first thing we learned was the timeline we created really sucked. We had a one and a half year or less timeline, and we thought, great, we're all dedicated, we're gonna get this done, and no, we didn't. It took us really almost three and a half years to get the process done, and I could tell you that several times in that three and a half years, it seemed like we were gonna go nowhere with it. So if you're gonna do anything this big, and, and this, you know, involving so many agencies and so many steps, really probably I would say create your timeline and double it because that was our experience. And then when we talked to people afterwards, they were like, oh yeah, we could have told you that. Anything we ever do takes twice as long as we think. Um, the other thing that was interesting was our lease negotiations for the space. It became a huge time eater and we really couldn't do anything until we had the signed lease because we couldn't order supplies to go there. We couldn't move in and you know fix up the place and all that kind of stuff. And the lease process itself was very difficult just because you know it involved a lot of lawyers and legal terms and who wanted this and who wanted that and all that. So that took a while to get through. And then the approval process for the lease really was difficult, mainly because this was a Drexel project being housed at another competing health systems offices. So you can imagine the angst that that caused the board of directors when they were going, getting ready to sign off on it, they were like, wait a minute. Why is Drexel renting space on our campus to provide services? And oh my God, they're gonna bring that big dragon emblem here and plaster it all over our campus and we can't have that. So we had to have a lot of meetings with their board to say, no, we're not gonna bring the big dragon on campus and you know, flood it with Drexel's name and logo and all that other stuff. And they kind of got it after a while and they signed off on the lease and we were able to move uh, forward. We then had some unexpected startup costs and needs. Uh, the first one was personal care supplies. So, you know, we had to, we had to get some supplies for uh, victims, you know, like toothbrushes, toothpaste, uh, feminine care products, all that kind of stuff. The other big thing that we didn't think of at first but clearly became evident when we were talking to people is, well, we needed some snacks, we needed some drinks. These crimes happen all hours of the day and night. People may be hungry, et cetera, et cetera. So we had to buy snacks and juice boxes. And I'll tell you probably the best thing we bought was a Keurig coffee maker because everybody wants a cup of coffee when they come in, the police, the family, the visitors. So one of the best investments we made was to get one of those Keurig single cup coffee makers uh, and that, and people appreciate it. The police appreciate it when they come in. Victims have appreciated it and that. We had to buy some TVs, which we didn't expect, mainly to entertain the police officers and family members out in the waiting room. But also, some of my nurses decided that when they're on call, if they get called in, they're not gonna go home. They'll just stay at the center. So they were like, hey, could we have a couch to sleep on and a TV? So we put a couch in the office and put a TV hookup in the office so that they could have, you know, uh, be entertained and comforted while they're waiting. And then the other two expenses, which we didn't really count on at first, but kind of clearly realized we needed it, were a scheduling program and an answering service. So if we were fortunate enough to already have an answering service process, so we just tapped into it. It's the same one that the toxicology service here uses. And we went and contracted with an online scheduling program so that our nurses could just go in and click on which shifts they want to take call, and we approve it and that's our call schedule for the month. And I could tell you that we've had very little issues around our nurses taking call. Um, they all sign up for it, they all have second jobs. Uh, this is just a supplemental job for them and I have never had to beg somebody to come take a shift or to cover a shift. And in fact, several shifts we have too many nurses bidding for it and we have to make a decision who's gonna work that specific shift. And just remember, like I'm gonna tell people, really when you're gonna do a project like this, think outside of the box. You know, shoot for the stars, you want the Cadillac, go for the Cadillac, try everything you can to get the Cadillac, but realize you're sometimes gonna to have to settle um, for the Kia. And one of the things I settled for a Kia on was our office equipment. So all of the desks, and this is just a funny story, all of my filing cabinets, desks, bookcases, bookshelves, and chairs, I actually bought 
at a hospital fire sale. One of those hospitals that closed, they were completely getting rid of everything inside of the hospital. So I went and bought, they told me, come out here, you can take what you want, and we'll even deliver it to your center. So for 125 bucks, I got all of my desks and filing cabinets and all that equipment. So that was a huge savings in our startup budget. Uh, and yeah, they do work, the drawers do move and everything. So. so what about the future? Where do we see our center going or what's going to be happening? Well, the good news is the city has finally decided to go forward with those co-location plans. And in fact, we're going to have a collated site, co-located site with the Special Victims Unit, the Department of Human Services, Children's Services, and the Children's Alliance, who do all the forensic pediatric uh, exams and interviews. This is a new construction site. It's going to be uh, over on Whitaker and East Hunting Park Avenue over by St. Chris's there. And the target date is to open the center on uh, April of 2013. Um, we're going to have 1,200 square feet in that area. We're going to be right adjacent to the Special Victims Unit. And it's going to be um, a great benefit that the police are going to be there. And there's going to be space for the Rape Crisis Center. There's going to be space for the District Attorney's Office and all that so that everything will be very victim-centered in one location. Now, this is going to create some new issues for us, which we have to work out. One is uh, moving. So after we just moved into everything and set everything up, we have to move it to a whole new center. But we have to be able to move it and not interrupt patient services. So we're going to have to keep the setup at the existing place while we set up at the new place so that when the new place opens, we're ready to go if we have a victim five minutes later. So that's going to be interesting. And then two other issues are going to be Right now, we have a hospital attached to us, so we have very easy access for sharps services, red bag, trash, all that kind of stuff. We're not going to have to figure out a way to incorporate that into an office building and have an outside service do that. And what happens if there is a medical emergency? Right now, I said we didn't have to call any rapid response teams, but those patients that had to get emergency care, it was very easy. The nurse just walked them down to the emergency room and brought them to the triage desk. Now we're going to have to call 911 to have an ambulance take them to those locations or the police if they can ambulate and that kind of stuff. And then one of the exciting things that's coming forward is we're going to be looking at developing a mobile team. So this is going to be a team where we could send the nurse to the hospital to do the exam for victims who may have been a victim of trauma, maybe has a head injury and has to be admitted to the ICU because of their trauma injury, but they were also raped and the nurse will go out to that hospital and do the rape kit and evidence collection there. This way we don't lose valuable evidence and that kind of stuff. Um, this is going to be a huge task because we're now going to have to deal with every individual hospital system and um, all of their you know, permutations of what they think it should look like and be. But we're going to move forward with that. And in fact, I have a meeting this Friday with one of them who reached out to us that they wanted to start this. Um, and our goal is to look at the trauma centers first because we feel that's where we're going to get a lot of the victims in that they have other injuries, they're going to be taken to a trauma center and be treated for those injuries, and then we'll focus on their sexual assault after that. <clears throat> and I ha this, you can't read it because I had to turn it sideways to get it to fit, but this is going to be the new plans for the new center for our space. So basically over here are two offices, here's two supply rooms, um, here's a bathroom, a waiting area, uh, a desk for like the nurse for their charting, and two um, much bigger examination rooms. So kind of the same stuff we have, but just made a little bit bigger and reconfigured for us. So uh, what do I want you to take home out of this talk? I think, you know, one is to learn about the different models of um, what a medical SART is, because a lot of you I know are emergency medicine residents and you're going to go out to practice in different communities and you may be called upon or need to know what those systems are and ways you can improve your own systems. A private co-located uh, service is a viable alternative to the hospital-based busy emergency department. Um, one of the keys to this whole process was buy-in from everyone. This was not me or Drexel creating this model and saying, this is how we're going to do it. This was several months of meetings among all the key stakeholders and all the programs and everybody else that this is probably the best thing to do for victims. Um, we had very careful planning and development, and a lot of things happened simultaneously. So while we were negotiating the leases, 
<clears throat> at night I was home writing protocols and sending them back and forth to people to review and all that kind of stuff. And then just be adaptable. I, I think that's probably the biggest thing I can say. Like, you know, we had a vision one way and we had to change it I don't know how many times and reconfigure things and redo things. But I could tell you that we just came from our meeting today and, you know, once again, no major issues were identified by everybody, by anybody at the table. And in fact, everybody would say, you know, in follow up when victims are going to the rape crisis center, they're being told by them that, hey, I had a great experience over there. It was very nice. I, I wasn't treated like a number. I wasn't, you know, just heard it through the process of an emergency department. I was treated as an individual. So uh, I think we've proven now in Philadelphia that this model will work for us and can work for us. And hopefully it'll continue for the next, you know, 50 plus years until sexual violence is totally eliminated. So. Okay, any questions? Okay. Linda? <clears throat> uh, very good question. So if anybody didn't hear that, about emotional support for the victims. So we actually have a great relationship with women organized against rape in that when a victim presents, we actually call for a rape crisis advocate to come to the center to talk to the victim and begin their process along that line. So that's always available. And then <clears throat> in our follow-up, we do follow-up with all of our victims via phone. We make sure that they've made contact with war. And on a couple of occasions where they haven't yet, we've actually intervened and made them that appointment and told them what to do and how to get there and all that kind of stuff. Thanks. Right. So <clears throat> there's a federal law that mandates that rape victims do not need to do not need to pay for their services, to, for evidence collection and all that kind of stuff. So Pennsylvania has the Victims Compensation Program where they will pay for forensic rape exams for victims if they don't want their insurances billed or if they don't have insurance and all that. So we rely heavily on using that service to pay for their evaluation services. And we're always out looking for um, grants and funding and all that kind of stuff too. Yes, they build, you could bill up to a maximum. They pay up to a maximum, so. So basically, we're, uh, we're a project of the Department of Emergency Medicine of Drexel University College of Medicine. So all of the nurses are employed technically by Drexel. They're non, I think they're called temporary employees or something, they have no benefits or anything like that. But what it does is it allows us to pay them on Drexel payroll checks and all that kind of stuff. And the fact that it's part of Drexel allows us to say we're a nonprofit. We can apply for grants through any of the agencies that fund nonprofits. When we go for research grants or we want to do any research, we have all that behind us as well. So it's really a great model for all of those reasons. Yes, and I, I can tell you probably, <clears throat> without letting the cat out of the bag just yet, that uh, um, Mr. Stamatakis, who was chairman of the Board of Trustees of DUCOM at the time, is going to be honored next year by uh, Women Organized Against Rape for his work on this uh, with their Bridge to Courage Award. So I think somebody else had a hand up. So my bias is you're, you're an emergency physician and you should know how to do a rape exam on any patient that comes in. Um, ideally, if it was something that was a short-term you know, medical issue, we just had one of these here at Hahnemann where the patient was intoxicated and too intoxicated to go to the center. Um, we kept them in the emergency department to address their medical needs and correct all their problems and then transfer them over to the center. So if that option is available, I would say go for that model. But until then, you really should try to provide that service for the victim if you can. And how does that work? I mean, legally, the best means, and, and you have to be certified to do something like that, or as long as you have a rape kit and follow the instructions, you're considered 
Um, no, actually, um, if you've never collected a rape kit, it's not very much rocket science. They actually put instructions in the kit to walk you through it if you needed to. So it, it's a time-consuming process, but it's not that hard. And I think the fact that any evidence is better than no evidence, and I think just by the fact that you're a physician will hold enough credibility in the court of law to say, oh, a physician did the exam, that's fine. So I will, hopefully this doesn't go on tape, but I will put this out there that um, I'd be happy to help out in any of those situations now that I am privileged at said institutions. <laughs> I've done it here. I, to, you know, there was a couple, two cases at least. Right. 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 <clears throat> but I've gotten here to Hahnemann where they've had trauma patients in the ICU who when they woke up or whatever said they were raped or there was a suspicion of a rape and I came in and I just did the rape kit myself upstairs in the ICU, so. Question, more on the microscopic level. When, when there's a patient who's been raped, is there a How long, do, how long do I have? <laughs> so it's a good question. In fact, we just talked about it today um, <clears throat> at our uh, meeting around a case of a, a woman in the city who was raped and had uh, pretty severe uh, cerebral palsy. And <clears throat> they were able to do a rape kit on her and do a whole forensic history. It was very tough. It took several hours to do it. And then they used some other special techniques to get her testimony into court, where she actually testified via a voice interpreter, um, which was probably the first time it's ever been done in Pennsylvania. Uh, and they actually got a conviction on that case. So everybody was very happy with it, that it went so well. <clears throat> and one of the, you know, I put Temple up there as being part of the uh, team. Um, they have a center for disabilities, and they're a very active participant in the SART. And they actually helped the DA's office with all of the background information and finding the right interpreters and how to do it and how to introduce it into court and all that kind of stuff. I think you have to be creative and it may not be the time to do the exam immediately. Um, you have up to 72 to 120 hours to do the exam. Clearly you want to do it quicker just, you know, for the victim's sake, but you may have to find other resources like call your police department, call your rape crisis center and say, I have this special needs victim. What are the next steps? What should we do? and all that, and you may be able to coordinate services that way. So HIV prophylaxis is interesting because there's a lot of um, controversy around it in general. Um, but clearly one of the key features to giving HIV prophylaxis is that you have to have a willing patient who is going to follow up and go to get the rest of the medications and get tested and that kind of stuff. So I'm not sure I would give that patient HIV prophylaxis just because I'm not sure the quality of the follow-up, are they going to follow up and that kind of stuff. As far as Catholic hospitals and emergency contraception. The uh, Catholic Bishops Association actually has a whole guideline and protocol on the use of emergency contraception in rape. And it actually can be done, and they actually aren't against it. The problem is how that gets interpreted on the hospital levels, and, that, and several of them take an approach of, nope, Catholic Church, Catholic Hospital, not touching that. I will tell you, though, Pennsylvania has a a regulation, a health hospital regulation 
that states if you do not give emergency contraception to rape victims, you must provide either transfer to a hospital or facility that does, or have an alternative way for that patient to get the emergency contraception. And, you know, I've heard some centers that actually the rape crisis advocate brings the packet of emergency contraception to the hospital with them, and they say, do you want it? And the, yeah, and they'll hand it to the, you know, they'll hand it to the patient. So um, there are some ways around it, but basically to be in compliance with the state law, you need to provide that service somehow. Just telling them to go to the pharmacy because it's over the counter doesn't work. We're not here to bash the Catholic Church. Any other questions? So good question. So the first question is, we, we collect some basic demographic information just for some statistics and for if we need to get in touch with them for anything. Uh, any other information? We only collect information that's relevant to the need for evidence collection. So we don't go with a whole detailed story of the whole crime and what happened. We leave that up to the police uh, and that. <clears throat> when we call them for follow-up, we basically just see if they have any needs or questions. We ask them if they had any side effects from the medications we provided. Uh, if we give the HIV meds, we give a five-day starter pack and then have a whole bunch of resources for them to go get the rest of their medicines. We make sure that they followed up and then they went to get the rest of their medications and that kind of stuff. We ask them uh, some screening questions for early uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And if they screen positive, we re immediately refer them to, um, to Women Organized Against Rape for counseling services or we even, you know, on one or two occasions, we've actually assessed them for possible suicidality and that kind of stuff and actually made contacts with the crisis response center for them and got them hooked up and got them care. So we, and we only call them if we, they tell us we can call them, that it's going to be safe or anything like that. So. Oh, that doesn't affect me at all. Right, so I, I think I heard it right. So if the victim is actually committing a crime as well? Yeah. It, yeah. Or they have. They have. So um, it doesn't affect me in a, either way. Like, I'll, I, I'm just there to do the exam and do the prophylaxis, et cetera, et cetera. I will tell you that our district attorney's office is very aggressive in going after the rapist, not the victim. So even if there was drugs involved or the purchasing of drugs or whatever, they, they will not prosecute the victim. They will go after the rapist. Uh, we have translator services available. So we use like the translator phone lines or, um, or the police actually have a lot of their own translators we can sometimes use. No, oh, thank you.